Good morning. morning. How are you all? It is good to be with the Gathered Church. Uh, I'm excited to to worship and to fellowship with you all this morning. I have a couple of announcements that I want to present before we get started with our service. Uh, The first one uh, is regarding student ministry. Disciple Now um, is coming up in just a few weeks. This is probably one of the most important things that we do um, in the student ministry throughout the year. So if you have a child, uh, seventh through 12th grade, the signups for that are due this Wednesday. So um, you can see in the bulletin there what what is needed to be able to get registered for that. But we're super excited. And I ask the rest of the church to begin praying um, for what God might do through that weekend um, in the lives of our host families and our students as well. Also, right after church today, there's going to be a uh, single seniors lunch. Um, So anybody, if if you didn't sign up for that, it's okay. You can still participate in it today. Um, The children's ministry will be serving lunch today in the fellowship hall. So uh, feel free to participate in that. And then also VBS is, seems super far away, but it's not. And so uh, we are beginning the process of recruiting volunteers for it. You can see uh, the schedule in there and there's signups at the Welcome Center Uh, for anyone who would like to volunteer, and we sure do need a bunch of them. So uh, the very last one is, uh, if you are not currently involved in an adult or adult Sunday school class, um, there is a Case for Christ Bible study. Danny Brown is going to be leading. His Sunday school room is in room 201, which is just the room right at the top of the stairs to the left. Um, So we want to encourage Sunday school is such an important time um, to build community with other believers Um, in kind of your same age bracket. And so this would be a great time if you're not already participating in one uh, to to get involved. And so that's starting on February 23rd. Um, So so please, uh, if you're interested in that, you can get more information from him or or we'd be be glad to point you in that direction. So lots of things going on in the life of our church. Uh, Let's take a moment to pause together and pray and invite God's spirit and presence um, to to be with us this morning. Father, we thank you for um, just the opportunity to gather and to encourage and lift one another up. Father, the church is designed as a place that we might strengthen each other, that we might love one another authentically, genuinely. Father, we pray um, that this morning the worship that we, uh, that we give, that we offer, might be an overflow of the worship that's been happening personally in our hearts and lives this week. Lord, we are so grateful for the cross and the resurrection, the new life, God, that as we walk in this world, we we have the hope of the future resurrection of of new life and eternity with you. But Father, we we also recognize that you have saved us um, for for your cause, the, the cause of the gospel, the good news of renewing a people who will worship and honor you, being transformed into the image of your son. Father, we thank you. I pray that this morning uh, we would be attuned to your spirit and what you might be speaking to us. And Father, we pray ultimately that everything we do and say this morning and in our entire lives would be oriented uh, around your glory. We thank you so much for this time together, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together today as we worship. Our Lord has broken every chain. Jesus 
Amen. As we continue to act of worship today, why don't you find those around you and welcome them to Calvary Baptist Church today. Amen. Start making your way back to your seats with us as we continue in worship. Praise 
Romans 16, verse 12 says this. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare what to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. That is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Let's continue singing uh, today this hymn called Do You Hold Me Fast? When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold He saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious. with us today.
then our chains are gone. We've been set free. As the choir exits today, um, we're going to dismiss our children ages four to second grade. Before they start running out, we're going to have a change of venue today. Um, so well, they are going to be in the chapel. We'll be on the far end of the church. So um, if your child is four to, ages four to second grade, they're dismissed now. And if you're new with us and want to follow them and see where the chapel is, please feel free um, to do that at this time. Uh, we're going to introduce a new song um, to you all this, this morning that um, is entitled Goodness of God. And it just, um, the course of the song says, I will sing of the goodness of God. So as we sing this morning, I invite you to worship along with us, um, whether by singing or by reflecting upon the Lord. Not that song. Can you please pause the CD player? There we go. As beautiful as Amazing Grace was, we're going to do a different song.
so good and your uh, mercy never fails Lord we just pray that as we hear your word through through brother David today that we will respond and it will change our hearts today in your name we pray Amen. the goodness of God and the difference that he is he's made in each of our lives I invite you to open up the scriptures to first Peter chapter number one first Peter chapter number one My microphone on. Can you guys hear me? All right, good. Um, First Peter one. We've been talking about exiles who are traveling home. We're we're living between the now and the not yet. We are living in the present day, and we are on our way home. And we are searching for glory. And we've been walking with Peter as he's been talking about salvation over this first chapter, and looking at it from the past, the present, um, and today. Or we're looking at the future, the present, and today we are going to be looking at the past together. You know, we live in a great time. We sure do when it comes to technology and some of the things that we enjoy, the advances of them. And one of them is high definition cameras. They allow us to see things with the naked eye that we're not able to see. uh, They allow us to see things we're not able to see with the naked eye. And one of them is lightning. Um, Brother Ron Nelson was teaching me a little bit about lightning. And and I had never understood about lightning, how it returns back into the atmosphere, how it will strike the earth and then it will go straight back up looking for something um, to contact with. And in a high definition camera that captures a lightning strike, you see it go down and you see it go back up as it slows down all the frames for us to be able to see it with the naked eye. One of the neat things it does is, is when you can magnify something and it bring into focus parts of uh, elements that we didn't really know all about. So I'm going to do something this morning, okay? Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures that are are magnified. Some of them 50,000 times magnified, some of them 3,000 times. And, and I want you to do this. I want you to, uh, the person you're sitting by or somebody around you, I want you to tell them what you think it is, okay? I want you to tell them what you think it is. All right, let's throw up the first picture. Here it is. All right, so what do you think this is? Tell the person beside you, okay? All right, so have you locked your answer in with the person beside you, all right? So uh, this is uh, magnified 50,000 times. It is a snowflake, right? It's a snowflake. How many of you got snowflake, all right? Um, Somebody raised their hand. We don't believe you, all right? So (laughs) snowflake, all right? Picture number two, all right? Ooh, look at that, okay? So uh, lock in your answer with the person beside you. What do you think it is? What do you think it is? All right? This is magnified 3,000 times. It's the back of a bumblebee. It's the back of a bumblebee. How many of you got bumblebees? All right. Now, somebody may get this one. Somebody might get this one. I'll go ahead and go with this picture here, okay? Um, This is magnified about 3,000 times as well. Take a look at that. Kind of lock in. You might get this one. You might get it. Tell the person beside you how smart you are. This is a peacock feather. How many of you got that? All right, Michelle got it. Peacock feather. Now think about this. And this isn't the sermon, but think about God's intricate design and weaving together those glorious colors and creating this, this, this beautiful, beautiful feather. Okay? I've got one last picture, okay? This is actually a selfie I took trying to put my contacts in this morning, but <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. Not really, not really. All right. So I want you to think about something about Go ahead and get that off the screen. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about 1 Peter chapter number 1. Now think about magnification for just a moment. What those cameras are able to do is take things that are common to us and blow them up and give them an image to the point where we don't even recognize what it is. We're looking so deep into it, we, we can't see it. Now, if you don't know what it is, that's really not that helpful right? But if you know what it is, you can look at the details that are there, and it gives you an appreciation for what's there. 
this morning, we're continuing to talk about salvation. And what Peter does in these verses of 3 through 12, he magnifies it for us. He turns the bright light on the, the, the process of salvation that's taking place in our lives, and the difference of what Christ has done in time, and the woven thread through history of what salvation is, and, and, it, and it exposes us to things about our faith and our understanding of what God has done that we have never, ever seen before. Over the last three weeks, we, we started with the future, didn't we? How God, blessed be the God and Father of your Lord Jesus Christ, and what he's done for us in the future is that he has, he has borne us to a what? A living hope that we look to the future and we know it is secure. Last week, when we looked at those middle verses of 6 to 9, remember he talked about the present, how we're walking in the now, and we walk through trials, and we walk through difficulties, and, and it is taking us to the not yet. And we understand that picture of tribulations, and maybe you see the picture of that tribulum coming over the top of your life. And it is harvesting in you that which is, that which is pure, that which is refined. And on the other side of this, there is a life that's been radically changed by God. See, that's a, that's a glimpse that's magnifying what God has done for us. Now, now Peter does this in this passage. He doesn't start with the past first. He, start, he, he ends with the past. And he ends with the work of the Holy Spirit in the past. And, and I think it's interesting, and just, uh, just a couple of anecdotal things about this, that, 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 that I don't know why Peter intended this, but I can't think that we learn to say, a lot of individuals don't recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And they, they don't realize that the same Holy Spirit that worked in the Old Testament is the same Holy Spirit that works in the New Testament. It works in the day and age in which we live. And so Peter takes a, a glimpse to the past, and he highlights the work of the Holy Spirit, and he does it through three different ways. And here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how it's been magnified by the prophets, how it's been magnified by the preachers. And by that, we mean simply those that will any place, any time proclaim the name of Christ and how it's been magnified by the angels as well. So let's read the text and think about what it has to say. Verse number 10. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. So in the time that we have today, let's think about what the past has done. A famous quote from literature says this, all the past is prologue. All the past is prologue. It was written by, it was written in a Shakespeare play. And it tells us that everything that has happened up until this point has happened for a purpose and a reason and prepared us for this particular time. I want you to think about today in your life as we think about those things that are ancient and those things that actually are in eternity past, what difference do they have for you today? The difference that they can make in, in your life today. So find encouragement from these things. Number one, salvation is magnified by the prophets. Salvation is magnified by the prophets. The lion's share of this text deals with the prophets and their work in salvation history. The beginning of chapter number 10, verse number 10, all the way through the beginning of verse number 12, deal with what the prophets did. First thing that we see is that they searched and carefully investigated. Before we dive in there, let's think about what we mean by the word prophet. Oftentimes someone says the word prophet means to predict the future. And, and certainly that, that did take place. They prophesied, being led by the Holy Spirit, as to what would take place 
in time. But the prophets were not simply just um, truth tellers about the future. The prophets also spoke to their particular people in their time and in their day about what God was doing. They were the mouthpiece of God to the people. They would share the words of the Lord to those that desperately needed to hear. This was the prophets. You have them listed in your Bible. We have major prophets and, 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 and minor prophets. That doesn't mean that they were under the age of 18. It simply means that the books were probably a little bit shorter and um, focuses on different portions of God's history with Israel and with, with Judah. So the first one is this, is that the prophets searched and they carefully investigated. The word of the Lord had come to them. The word of the Lord was being spoken to them and concerning our salvation. Remember what the first phrase said, concerning your salvation, concerning this salvation. The prophets talked about the grace that was going to come to you. So they see this in time. They look forward and they see Messiah coming, being born of a man, or being born of a woman, and giving his life for all of humankind. And the Bible says that they searched and they investigated. They sought it out. They wanted to know more. It informed their prophecies. It informed their writings. It informed the leadership of the people. The next phrase says that they inquired time and circumstances. You say, what does that mean? What was it talking about? What do you think about Micah 5 and 2? That said, you know, Christ is going to be born in, in Bethlehem of Judea. Though there is little among the thousands of Judah, out of you the Christ child will come. That when Isaiah was prophesying about the sufferings of Christ, he was inquiring about the time and the circumstances that surrounded him. As they were talking about the, the magnification of the one and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Remember that we quote at Christmas time? The time and the circumstances that surrounded the life of the one who is going to set them free. We are magnified or salvation is magnified by the role of the prophets and what we understand about who Christ is. You know what the greatest witness of these two things are? Is the ministry of Jesus himself. Ministry of Jesus himself. When Jesus, after he, had, after he, after the resurrection, remember when he's walking on the Emmaus Road with those two disciples? They didn't know who he was. What, is the, what does the Bible say about how he began to tell them the, the framework of everything that had just taken place in Jerusalem? The Bible says, beginning with Moses and the what? The prophets. He spoke of all things concerning himself. So Jesus declared the searchings and the investigations and the time and the, 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 the time and the circumstances about himself that the prophets had declared up to a thousand years before Christ ever walked the earth. He spoke the words of the prophets to them. Right in the middle of this, we see that they were led by the Holy Spirit. If you will look there in the middle of verse number 11, they inquired into what time and what circumstances the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, within them was indicated. The Holy Spirit of God, we read about it this morning, the one that would declare to us who Jesus was and declare who Jesus is and, and, and speak to his disciples what his teachings were in John 15, 16, and 17. The work of the Holy Spirit of God, what Jesus left for us when, when he says, I won't leave you orphans, I will send you a comforter, I will send you an advocate. They were led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, think about this, and just wave this in time. Think about how beautiful this is. That, that God, 3,000 years before any of us were ever born, 
was weaving in the hearts of the prophets, speaking to them about how he was going to redeem the world to himself. His intentional plan in history to redeem you and to redeem me for his glory. Let me make a public service announcement here this morning for uh, any married men. Um, Friday is Valentine's Day. Just, just in case you don't know that, it's coming. And, and, and you know what? You ought to be prepared for that, right? So, so think about days like that that are special, that we simply pour blessings and gifts in and, 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 and honor on the one that we love. What gift means the most? The one that was picked up in the convenience store on the way home Friday afternoon? Or the one that's meticulously and intentionally planned for? You know the answer, don't you? The one that was well thought out. The, the one that long before the day ever ever came, how can I honor my significant other on this Valentine's Day? By treating them with honor. Think about what Christ did in time for you, being led by the Holy Spirit and the investigation of the, of the prophets. He intentionally, for centuries and millennia, brought salvation to us. See, not only did they talk about what was taking place in their time and what would take place ahead of time, they also talked to us about the sufferings of Christ. And this was interesting because those that lived in Israel had some, had some preconceived notions about who Christ was going to be. Most of them thought that he was going to be a liberating governmental person. He was going to be a king. He was going to be that type of a leader that was going to set them free from oppression. No more captivity. Nobody... Nobody coming back in their land and telling them what to do with it. Nobody telling them how they could worship and when they could worship. Nobody they had to pay taxes to anymore. No more foreign vassals coming in and ruling. That's what they thought the Messiah was going to be. But it's interesting how the prophets like Isaiah and Isaiah 53 would say, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He was talking about a suffering service that, that Christ would be. As a sheet, what do you think about these poetic words? As a sheet before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. A humble servant willing to lay down his life that he would be crucified, that he would be crucified between criminals, that he would receive lashings, that he would be mocked, that he would be rejected. As the psalmist tells us that the, 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 the chief cornerstone has been rejected, the stone which the builders rejected. And then they also prophesied about the glories that would follow about his resurrection. And that everyone would know that he's king of kings and lord of lords. Is, and, and, and the grave would not hold him. In 1 Corinthians 15, those poetic words. Death, where is your sting? Grace, where is your victory? Those come out of the Old Testament. And the prophet spoke them of Christ and his coming. And saying, even then, centuries before Christ ever lived, we mocked death. That was spoken of Christ, the glories that would follow. There's an interesting verse, or there's an interesting phrase that catches my attention. Right there in the beginning of verse number 12, because for, for, for two solid verses, it talks about all these things about the prophets and everything that they've done for us and everything that they've prepared for us. And then in verse number 12, it tells us about an understanding they had. Now think this. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Did you catch that? It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Think about the gravity of that statement. Messiah is coming. You're not going to see him. 
the liberator's coming. You won't know him. All this oppression is going to pass away. But you won't experience it in your lifetime. But yet even then, what did they do? In their time they served and they prophesied and they told of Christ and they were the mouthpiece for God. And the hope of the Messiah continued because of their contribution. I don't know about you, but there's a biblical principle there, isn't there? Think with me about something. Remember Abraham in the book of Genesis that the promise that was made to him says, get up out of your land and to a land that I am going to take you to, a land that will be yours. And, 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 and God told him, he says, and, and, and there I'm going to make your descendants as, as numerous as the, as the sands on the seashore. You know what's interesting? Abraham never saw that. He never saw it. What did he do? He acted on the promises of God. Abraham, as an old man, saw Isaac. If you read the scriptures, it even tells us this, is that, that, that Abraham never owned a piece of land in Israel until he bought a burial place for his wife. This land he was going to give him. Well, what did he do? He faithfully did exactly what God told him. Let me ask you, did Noah see the fulfillment of everything that God intended? Noah saw a lot. Saw a lot of stinky animals on a boat, right? Saw a lot of people reject his message. Saw a lot of rain. Saw a lot of water. He saw a glorious covenant of God's word to him. But he didn't see everything that would take place from his act of faithfulness. What did he do? He was faithful in his time. The prophets were not serving themselves, but they were serving us. And it was revealed to them, and they still did it anyways. In my office, I have a book that is entitled Lives Entwined. The book is tremendously special to me for this reason. It's written by Finley F. Gibson and his wife. And uh, Finley F. Gibson, at the turn of the century, was the pastor of the Walnut Street Baptist Church in Louisville. There's a chapter called Conversion Stories in there, and the, the story can get extremely long, but I'm going to give you the short, first, short version of this. The pastor that I grew up under was an eight-year-old little boy. Finley F. Gibson writes in, the, writes in his book, it says, The Oldham Family Conversion. He was the youngest boy and um, had two older brothers. And he visited their house because a lady by the name of Phyllis Stokely met him on a train and told him about them. That, that was it. And he goes to visit them. And from that, every member of the family came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Those three boys all became pastors, made it from... Louisville, Kentucky, to Lansing, Michigan, to Union, Kentucky, and then Bowling Green, Kentucky in the 1950s. And in the 70s, his ministry intersected with me and radically changed my life. Now think about this. That in 1938, a pastor was just following up on a name that someone had given him about some individuals that may want to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. Had no idea what would take place from that home. Had no idea how the kingdom of heaven would be eternally impacted by the influence of that home. What was he doing? He wasn't serving himself. He was serving them. What a great principle for believers in the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ in the 21st century. You serving, you leading... It's not about you. It might be about somebody coming to know Jesus Christ and what's going to take place in their life for eternity. It's about them. When we, when we give to missions, we don't know who that's going to impact for the kingdom of God and what the story is going to bring 100 years from now. It's about them. You take care of that just awful kid in vacation Bible school. 
And I can say that because I was an awful kid in vacation Bible school. You take care of them. You love on them. You show them the way of Christ. And did you hear the story on Christian radio this week? The, what, the, 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 the one out of Nashville. Maybe you've heard this. This lady says this. She says, I grew up in the home of an atheist. And when I was five years old, I was sent to vacation Bible school for one night. And once her dad found out about where she was, she wouldn't let her go back. But she said that night she went and a teacher taught her this one verse of scripture out of Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. She says she never, ever forgot it. And as a young adult, someone came to her showing her the beauty of what it means to follow Christ. And that verse that had always been in her mind came to reality that she was a sinner and desperately needed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it radically changed her life for eternity because a faithful VBS teacher 20 years before thought enough to instill in her the word of God. Didn't know her name. Didn't know where she was. But the gospel impacted her life. It's magnified by the prophets what they did, the difference that they made. The next thing is akin to what we're speaking of because we think about this. The salvation is magnified by the, by the preachers. It comes to a contemporary significance for them. These individuals who are in Asia Minor, the, these individuals who are not first-generation believers, these in, individuals who are probably have heard the gospel from those who were at the, at, in Jerusalem on Pentecost. These people came to Asia Minor with the gospel. And these pockets that we read about in verse number 1 in Galatia and Pontus and, 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 and in Asia, they told them the good news. And so what he says, he says, this is magnified by those that proclaim the gospel, the preachers. Please, when you hear the word preacher, do not simply allow the image of a man standing behind a lectern in a, with a Bible be the only thing that comes to your mind. To preach is to proclaim the good news. And if you go out and tell it, you are proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And this is what they did. There can be made a case from the book of Acts that it was probably, that it was probably individuals just like you and me that went and took them the gospel. Ordinary people. Nothing extraordinary about them except for their faith. And he says it's been magnified by those that shared the gospel with you. In the middle of verse number 12, those words are absolutely rich that Peter gives us. When he says this, these things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by who? By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. God intentionally working in time through a human vessel so that your life could be radically changed. That expands and magnifies our understanding of salvation. They proclaimed the gospel and they were led by the Spirit. One last thing. And this is the most interesting one of, of all of them to me. Is that it was magnified by the angels. Did you catch that last phrase, verse number 12? And it simply says this. There's not even a break in the sentence. That doesn't stop. It says, angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. The angels of heaven. Use your sanctified imagination at this particular point. Who are eternal beings. have taken all of this in full view through the centuries. C can you see their interest in what's taking place? You know that the Bible declares that salvation was for us. And they see the grand 
story of the ages take place. I can't help but think they are leaning over the rail of heaven. I just made that up. That's probably not in scripture. The rail of heaven. And they are looking intently. They're looking intently at the work of redemption history taking place in this world. And it's magnified by the interest of angels in time. I read a quote this week that's so interesting that, that just lets us know that God's, God's work is not going to be thwarted. It's not going to stop. That, that he intentionally has done this in time and the, the gospel is to be shared with all those that we can. A man by the name of Voltaire, his French name, I put it up there for you. He lived from 1694 to 1778. Here's what he said this. He says, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on the earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. Hold up your Bible or your phone if you have one with a Bible on it today. How about that? Yeah, that's more than one, right? Now, now what was that? That was a mistaken man in time thinking that somehow, some way, that this was a fading thing. The history of it wasn't magnified to him. He didn't know about what God had done in time. In the 1950s, there was a show that came on television. I have to admit to you, I didn't see it in the 1950s. <laughs> you remember, here's how it started. This is your life. Now, there was a remake of it in the 1970s as well as in the 80s and in the year 2000. And, and here's what this is, this is your life. What would it entail? You have an individual who was sitting there by a host and a narrator, and he would narrate particular details of his life that were so interesting. And, and there would be a reunion of types because what they would have is they would have characters from their life that made a big difference in their life. Your second grade teacher, Mrs. Collins, and she'd come walking in and they'd hug and they'd celebrate their life. People found it extremely interesting to be able to pull back the curtain and look deep into the difference that had taken place in somebody's life. They would use celebrities. They would use political figures. And they would say, this is the difference of investment in someone's life and what it can make. Do you realize, do you realize that Peter, in first chapter, we, we could almost say this at the beginning in verse number three, if you know Christ. This is your life. The prophets declared it. Oh, the Savior is secure. The Holy Spirit is empowering it. And one day, it will be eternal in the presence of God. This is your life magnified. So friend, I invite you today. You don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Can I tell you, up until this point in your life, this day, this is everything that God has done for you. I would encourage you to look into the Word as to what you need to do with it. Believer, this is your life. This is what God has done for you and what God wants to continue to do in you. Love Him and embrace Him for it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for directing us to what your word has to say about our relationship with you. And Father, we pray that in this time of invitation, the opportunity to respond, Lord, that you would speak to the heart of one that needs to come to you today. So, Lord, we pray that we leave today with hearts that are clean, 
consciences that are clean before you and seeking you out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand everywhere? Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song that might speak to exactly right where you are today. It, it, it's, it's a song that says, come to the altar. That's an invitation that's there. It's what we call the area here at the front of a church. And it's just an opportunity to do business with the Lord. If, if you need to embrace him as Savior and Lord, you can come right to where I am. To my left, there's a door that says next steps. We have some counselors right there. If, if you'd like to go to there, I would encourage you to do that. If there's something else that you need to do, I encourage you to do it today. Come pray. Come pray with somebody. But just seek the Lord today. Let's, let's sing this together.
don't leave this place without doing business with the Lord that you need to do today. If you need to talk with somebody about salvation, please don't walk out that door. I encourage you to go to the Next Steps area. I'll be in the foyer and promise, let me promise you, the most important conversation I want to have with anybody today is about how you can know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I encourage you to seek him out today. All right. Tonight we are uh, excited to start back music in motion for uh, our kids ages 4 to 6th grade. Uh, we're going to have a fun time. In preparation for that, if, um, if you're sitting on this side, if we could have our members back to chair. Of the um, room that are available for the game tonight. Um, also, in a few weeks, um, Mark A. Shore here a little bit more about it in the coming weeks. Um, Miss Katrina Moy is heading up a bluegrass jam here at the church. Um, not the jam that you eat, a jam that you come and jam on your guitar or banjo, or whatever whatever you have. So um, that's March the eighth. Um, if you are interested in that, um, you'll hear more inf info about that. Rob Kim will let you guys um, know about that um, ahead of time. March the eighth. Um, if you want to join us, go ahead and get your guitars out and your flags and things like you have about that. Um, let's all pray together, and then we're going to be dismissed at that point. Um, dear Lord, just thank you for the blood um, that, you, that was shed on the cross for our sins. And Lord, just we, we pray as we go out today that um, the burdens that we have collected this past day um, would become our daily routine in life, um, and that we would share the, the good news with others and would focus on what you have done for us um, in our lives. Just keep us safe as we go. In your name.